Hey everybody, what's up and welcome back to the garden. Today we are going to be taking a look around and taking a look at these insanely gorgeous ranunculus. Now, it's no secret that ranunculus are one of my absolute favorite flowers. I've been growing them for years now. And actually, um, you know, zinnias were the first flower that I ever grew. But ranunculus were actually the second flower that I ever grew. And not many people know that. Uh, so I'm really excited and eager to share the tips that I have um, here growing them. I am in Kentucky, zone 6B7, uh, depending upon the winter, just for a point of reference, because that will come into play, you know, as we get into this. And really, there's just so many just beautiful varieties, you know, once you start growing these things. It really is a slippery slope in terms of, you know, just kind of becoming addicted to growing these. Before we get started, I wanted to mention that this is a collab video with Flower Hill Farm. Uh, that's another awesome YouTube channel. Grows tons of flowers, lots of stuff going on over there that's really exciting. And I think what's really cool, what I want to do in the future is do more collabs with people who grow flowers, specifically cut flowers, because, you know, I've had several bad experiences uh, within the flower farming community, and I think it would be just so amazing and so cool um, to build a little flower farm community here on YouTube and collaborate with different flower farmers. I think that would be so incredibly awesome to build a real sense of a supportive community. Because, I mean, let's face it, social media can be tough. Um, it's always nice to have that support. So be sure to check out that channel and subscribe to it if you like it, of course. And uh, I hope you enjoy this video. Thank you so much. Don't forget to share it. Let's make this thing go crazy. Hit that like button too. Now on with the ranunculus. Uh, we're going to start out with corms. Here's what ranunculus corms look like. They look like these kind of little dried up octopus things. You generally can order these in the spring and in the fall and that will greatly depend on when you need to plant them uh, depending upon where you live. But they start out like this. The first thing we need to do is we need to soak them. So what I like to do is uh, I just put them in jars and put some water in the jars. Now there are tons of different ways to do this. Some people recommend that you use like a fish tank bubbler to make sure that the water is aerated. I've done that in the past, but I've also done it this way, just soaking them in water like this. And as long as you're keeping a close eye on them and not letting them over soak, um, usually it's fine. You don't have to kind of, you know, keep a drip going and all the different things that I've heard online. Uh, but emphasis, the key is to keep an eye on this. I usually soak these for no more than four hours, six hours at the absolute most. As you'll be able to see here in a second, after the soak, these things almost double in size. They get really big, nice and firm and plump when we've soaked them in the water. You can see here I'm also soaking anemone corms at this time. But um, if you over soak these, these are much more prone to rot and we obviously don't want rot and they can actually start breaking the little kind of growing arms can start breaking. So be very, very careful not to over soak them. I'm just using just regular tap water. After they have been soaked, I'm just going to grab a seed tray and I'm going to fill it with a moist potting mix. I am just using a regular potting mix that I got from the home improvement store simply because that's all I have. Um, as you can see, when we plant these, we want to make sure that the little arms or legs or whatever you want to call those are pointing down and that the crown of the corm is pointing up. Uh, what I like to do is just arrange these spaced carefully in a tray. Uh, the spacing is up to you. You can pack them very close together or you can pack them kind of farther apart. I usually do kind of a farther apart spacing just because I do let them grow on in the tray just a little bit since, you know, my garden is so small. So there's a little bit of turnaround time. So I kind of let them green up. After I have put them in the tray, I just cover the cover the corms with additional potting soil. Kind of just like I'm starting seeds in the tray. Nothing too technical or fancy with that. Here in my zone, I like to start these in October, the first week of October from a fall planting. Uh, the main reason I start them at this time is that the weather has cooled off. To get these to sprout, the ideal temperatures are about 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit overnight. Um, this is absolutely ideal weather that I have for that in the first week of October here in my zone. So I just put these trays outside. All I do is I put these trays outside and I let nature take care of them and nature take care of sprouting them. 
and generally I have very, very good results with that. Another option that some people do is uh, I think they mix a combination of like perlite and moss together and put the corms in a, you know, a vented bag or something in the dark. I honestly just, I don't have the details on that. So, you know, I can only offer so much information in terms of starting them that way. Unfortunately, I don't do it that way. Um, I just use this method using the potting soil because it is the easiest and the simplest for me. So, so if you have any information on how to start the corms uh, that way, I would love to hear about it down in the comments because I'm, you know, I always appreciate so much when I'm able to learn more from other people who grow the same stuff. And in doing so, we have some really lovely plants, transplants ready to go in the garden in the fall. I am here in zone 6B. These are technically hardy to zone 8, I believe. So that means they were not going to overwinter without some protection. This means that I was able to build a very makeshift hoop house polytunnel. If you are interested in the information regarding this polytunnel, I have a video for it. Uh, basically, it's made out of PVC and a little bit of plastic. The overall cost was, I think, just barely above $200. It's been three, maybe four years since I built this tunnel and I am still using it. So once I've got my tunnel up and constructed, I am just going to plant the ranunculus inside the tunnel. Usually I use about a six inch spacing between the plants and it seems to do pretty well. Also use this weed barrier landscape fabric to kind of help hold down the weeds a little bit. Uh, here in my yard, I have a lot of trouble with bittercress creeping around. Um, as you can see, the tunnel does a really good job of protecting our little plants throughout the winter. And um, even though I am, I do have, I guess, somewhat mild winters, we do get quite a bit of snow sometimes and cold temperatures all the way down to zero Fahrenheit. Uh, so while I can't offer perfect advice for everybody in every growing zone, um, it does take a lot of effort for me here in my zone to overwinter these. Um, you can see that I use row cover and frost blankets very frequently. In the past, I've just laid the frost blankets on top of the plants, but I found that that was a little bit troublesome. It would crush the plants. So you'll see a little bit later in the video, I eventually did move on to using um, just hoops, metal hoops in the low tunnel to create a low tunnel inside the hoop house. I know that sounds really convoluted, but um, you know, it is really needed because on those especially cold nights, you know, I do need the extra protection uh, in the hoop house. So in general, I find that the ranunculus are, you know, relatively fine as long as the temperature stays above 28 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, anytime it dips below that, I am always gonna use a row cover in addition to the hoop house. Um, in general, I think you really need to just take a close look at the low temperatures where you live and compare those to the lowest temperatures that the ranunculus plants can tolerate, which like I said, seems to be about that 28 degrees Fahrenheit threshold. Otherwise, you're definitely going to need some protection. And I think that's the most difficult part of growing ranunculus for the first time from a fall planting is determining whether or not um, they are going to be able to overwinter in your yard. The reason that I grow these overwintering in my yard is because if I planted them in the spring as soon as the soil could be worked, they would not do well. Uh, here where I live, it gets very hot and very humid very quickly in the spring. So a spring planting is, it's just not an option for me, unfortunately. From a spring planting, my plants will be very tiny. The blooms will be very tiny. So I do have to take this extra effort and care. And if you do want to grow a ranunculus for the first time, um, you know, and you have to do it this way, you don't have to build this giant hoop house. You can see I have these metal conduit hoops that I've made with a hoop bender. Um, you can use a very thick Agrabon fabric. Again, this whole process is about just trial and error, figuring out what works in your yard, what doesn't work in your yard, and going with it there. As you can see over winter, uh, sometimes during the coldest parts of winter, I do get problems with the plants. Sometimes they look a little bit more sickly uh, than other times. You know, sometimes last year, for example, had a lot of problems with mold. So this coming season, I am going to make sure to absolutely focus my time and my attention on making sure that the air circulation is really good in the hoop house. 
Um, there are just a ton of things that can go wrong, but there are also, you know, it's really rewarding when things do go right. So it's important to go into this with a realistic expectation. Usually by the time uh, March rolls around, things are really starting to look green and beautiful and our flowers are finally starting to bud up. Uh, usually the first buds show up at around 12 hours of daylight, maybe the late February. And again, this will vary depending upon the type that you choose. I've definitely noticed that some varieties, they start to bloom at different times, which is nice because you can kind of stagger your season and everything like that. Regardless of the bloom time, you will want to pay close attention to the variety in terms of, you know, actual plant height and things like that because there are some very dwarf varieties that are quite a bit shorter and of course that's not good if you're looking to use them for cut flowers. I also totally suggest that you make sure to buy from a reliable source, a reliable supplier. Uh, sometimes the corms that you get are not very double, they're single flowers or there are other types that cost a little bit more money such as the LaBelle series um, that are very full and very double and very just absolutely, you know, beautiful. So you do want to pay close attention to what type you're getting, where you're getting them, uh, to make sure that you're going to have the best results possible. As I already mentioned, um, some people, you know, you might have to wait to the spring to plant these. I'm trying to just make sure I hit all these points that I want to talk about here in this video. Uh, so choosing a planting time is going to be imperative. I, I only have experience here in my zone 6B7, so this is why I'm planting them in fall. It might be different for you depending upon how hot your summer is and all those things. And um, they're also great for cut flowers. Ideally, of course, we want to pick them early when they're still closed up. I have a I honestly, admittedly, I have a bad tendency to let the flowers completely open up here in my yard. And a lot of that has to do with the heat. While I would like to keep the flowers on the plants for as long as possible and, you know, really let them open up and uh, nice and slow and keep them cool, sometimes the days in the spring are just so hot that I'm not quite sure what to do. And they just open up on their own by the time I pick them. They're already fully open. The vase life will be a little bit shorter because of that, but most of these here in my yard go to flower donations anyway, just because, you know, my yard's not big enough to sell flowers and everything. And I think that's one of the main reasons that ranunculus are one of my favorites, is you do get so many flowers per, you know, plant, and they're gorgeous. They're just, you know, they're also a good replacement. I know people choose these over roses a lot of times. Not to mention they come in such a wide range of colors, which is awesome as well. In general, I find that they're pretty disease-free, um, other than problems that I had with mold this past year, but I'm gonna work to alleviate that. Also, it seems that most of the pests do leave them alone. I have had problems with aphids in the hoop house. Um, mainly what I do with the aphids is I just go through probably once a week with water and blast the aphids off. And that generally seems to control the problem pretty well. Um, in general, I'm not a, I don't use pesticides or anything. I'm very no spray here in my yard to keep things as natural as possible. And as you can see from the video, there's really not that much bug damage going on with the ranunculus, so I don't see a reason to use any kind of insecticidal soaps or, you know, anything like that. Other than that, uh, fertilizer, I do make sure in the fall that I'm planting into a nice well-amended bed, nice and rich. And I will go back in the spring once the buds start to show up and fertilize these with a bloom booster of some sort. Usually it's just, you know, um, like a compost mix. It really just depends on your own personal preference. Again, I like to keep things as natural as possible, so I use a lot of compost, a lot of natural stuff. I'm honestly not the best person to ask about fertilizers and all that jazz because I think, you know, everybody has their own different philosophy that they use. I get a lot of questions about whether or not you can save the corms after they are done blooming. Uh, these behave as a perennial in a lot of places, but I'm not sure how they behave as a perennial here in my yard. So this question is difficult for me to ask. Not to mention a lot of people treat them as annuals and just buy new corms every year. But I should also mention uh, that this last season, when the plants started to die back and turn yellow a little bit, I dug them all up. I took all the corms out of the ground and I just threw them in a bucket. And I just let them sit in my yard in a bucket and it, with drainage holes all season long. And now that the cooler weather has arrived, I have noticed that those corms are starting to sprout. 
So I am going to do more research about whether or not you can save them like that and how to save them, the best way to save them. I'm going to do more research about that this year and I'm going to report back to you guys whenever I make an update to this video. But um, my gut instinct right now is telling me that yes, um, if you really, you know, if you really want to, or if you live in an ideal climate, you can definitely save these, multiply these, you know, treat them as a perennial, and really get your money's worth for the flowers. So I think that is something that is going to be awesome once I kind of figure that out, so that we can build our supply of ranunculus and just have more and more and more ranunculus flowers every single season. It's gonna be so awesome. That's really about it for this video. I hope that it was helpful. Um, I tried to mention as many key points as possible, but if you still have a question, uh, be sure to leave it down in the comments below, and I will be more than happy to try to answer it. If you have any experience yourself growing ranunculus, or um, you know any tips or tricks or things that you found that really really help your flowers be sure to tell me all about them I love to hear from you guys like I said um, I always find that I learned more than anything I learned from you guys when you talk to me about what works in your zones uh, in the comments I think that's so cool one of my favorite parts of growing flowers if you are new to the channel be sure to subscribe uh, we'd love to have you we're just building our little garden community here I grow a lot of cut flowers but in the future I'd like to grow more vegetables and who knows what I'll end up growing uh, maybe we'll do some DIY projects so if you like a surprise you might like the channel too be sure to share this I would appreciate that so much share it with a friend tell them to subscribe hit the little bell icon to get notifications all that stuff would be awesome as always, you can support us on Patreon. Um, even the littlest bit means so much. It helps me It helps me keep the blog going and the channel going and uh, everything just running smoothly. Uh, you can check out our blog. The link is in the description down below. There's lots of kind of pictures and more information about the stuff that you see here on the channel. As always, we also have the Wax Melt Shop. All the links are down in the description. I am so incredibly thankful that you watched this video Thank you so, so much. I hope that y'all are having such an incredible day. I'll talk to y'all later. Bye, guys.